Hey everyone, this is Wes. This video is going to discuss the SPI system of the ATX Mega 128A1U microcontroller. Ports C, D, E, and F each have a single SPI module available, consisting of the following pins, Slave Select, MOSI and MISO, and the Serial Clock. Each data transmission consists of 8 bits, and they can be transferred least significant bit first or most significant bit first. The naming convention for labeling and differentiating each module is as follows. For example, the SPI module on port F is called SPIF. This table is from the alternate pin function section of the DOC 8385 manual. In this example, we're looking at which pins are used for the SPI module on port F. Here, we can see that there's a row for each pin on the port and a column for each peripheral module. For each SPI module, we can see that slave select is connected to pin 4, MOSI is connected to pin 5, etc. This pattern is the same for the SPI modules on ports C, D, and E as well. Below is a block diagram that shows roughly what an SPI module looks like internally. Both master and slave devices contain an 8-bit shift register. Each shift register's clock line is driven by the serial clock signal that is generated by the master device. The slave select pin on a slave device essentially tells it to stop ignoring signals on the data and the serial clock lines. While the slave select pin is driven low, or enabled, the serial clock signal will cause bits to be shifted between the master and slave's respective shift registers. Each SPI module can be configured to act as a master or a slave. When operating in master mode, the SPI module will be in control of when the data transfers are started as well as generating the serial clock signal. If the bus contains more than a single slave device, then there needs to be an IO pin used as a chip select for each slave device. When the master devices wish to initiate a data transaction with a slave device, it pulls the slave's chip select signal low and then initiates the transmission. If a single slave device is on the bus, its chip select pin can sometimes be permanently tied low, which causes any transmission by the master to be received. However, this is 100% dependent on the particular slave device in question. Some slave devices can operate this way, but some require the falling and rising edges of the chip select signal for synchronization. Once the full transmission is complete, if a chip select is used, the master pulls said chip select back high, thus officially ending the transmission. Slave mode is entirely different. In this mode, Nothing happens unless the slave select pin for a relevant SPI module is pulled low. When it is pulled low, the serial clock generated by the master device will cause each bit on the MOSI line to be shifted in and each bit on the MISO line to be shifted out. If the slave select is never pulled low, all information on the clock or data lines is ignored. Note that throughout the rest of this presentation, it is assumed that master mode will be utilized. Some details, if explicitly mentioned, may be different for slave mode. Next, we'll talk about the functionality of each of the four pins that make up each XMEGA SPI module. The first pin we'll discuss is slave select. This pin is only required to be used if the SPI module is configured as a slave device. In master mode, any available I.O. pin can be used as a chip select for some slave device on the bus but it is possible to use the slave select pin specifically. If, however, the slave select pin is not used, it is extremely important that it never gets pulled low accidentally. If it does get pulled low while in master mode, the SPI module reverts into slave mode. Thus, it is good practice to configure the slave select pin as an output, or at least as an input with a pull-up resistor connected. The next pin that we will cover is the MOSI pin, or the master out slave in pin. For master mode, it must be configured as an output. This pin is used as the medium for each bit of data to be sent from the master device to the slave device. Conversely, the MISO pin, or the master in slave out pin, is configured as an input and is used as the medium for each bit of data to be sent from a slave device to the master device. Notice how in this animation, the arrows that I'm using to represent each bit of data are going between the master device and the slave device at the same time. Finally, the serial clock pin must also be configured as an output in master mode operation. 
The X Mega supports the four common clocking modes that dictate the serial clock's phase and polarity. These modes are explained in more detail in the general SPI video, so I suggest you reference that if you need to. I would like to emphasize that a master and slave device that wish to communicate must be configured to use the same clocking mode. And now, finally, the initialization procedure for master mode's SPI operation. Most of the rest of this presentation will consist of explaining how each of these steps are performed and any useful details to know. Note that most of the configuration required for an SPI module is done by writing to the SPI control register. Thus, steps three through seven as highlighted here can potentially be performed with a single write to the control register. To begin the initialization, we'll configure the MOSI and serial clock pins as outputs, as well as decide how we will configure our chip select signals, if any. First, the MOSI and clock signals are configured as outputs. There is no requirement to specify their initial output voltages, but the serial clock pin could be initialized to have a voltage corresponding to its idle state. In other words, if the clock polarity is configured as low, then the pin could be configured to have a low voltage value by default. If there's only one slave device on the bus, a chip select may not be necessary. In certain situations, a slave device's chip select can be permanently tied low, but as mentioned in a previous slide, you must be positive that the slave device can function properly without the falling and rising edges of the chip select signal. Now that the relevant I.O. pins have been initialized, we can begin to configure some of the more fine details of the protocol itself. We'll start with setting the order of which the bits within each byte are transmitted. The first bit within the control register we will discuss is the data order bit. It configures the order in which the bits are transmitted and received, either least significant bit first or most significant bit first. This is a parameter of the protocol that will be defined by a given slave device. Next, we'll begin to configure the serial clock signal. The parameters we'll start with are the phase and the polarity. The transfer mode bit field is used to configure the serial clock's phase and polarity. These parameters have the same meaning as discussed in the general SPI video. Phase determines the sampling edge of the clock signal, and polarity determines the clock's idle voltage level. The table below shows the combination of bits for each mode, and the diagram to the right can be compared to a slave device's datasheet or timing diagrams to determine which transfer mode is appropriate. The last parameter of the clock signal we must configure is the frequency. The frequency of the serial clock is set by manipulating the prescalar bit field, which divides the peripheral clock by a specified amount, and the clock 2x bit, which simply multiplies the resulting frequency by 2. The net result is 8 unique serial clock frequencies for any given peripheral clock frequency. For example, assume the peripheral clock frequency is 2 MHz like it is by default. If we set the prescalar bit field equal to 0, 0 and set the clock to x bit equal to 1, we get a resulting frequency that is half of the peripheral clock frequency, as you can see in the third column. 2 MHz divided by 2 gives us a serial clock frequency of 1 MHz. The last two steps consist of enabling master mode as well as the entire SPI module. These two steps can be achieved by setting the master and enable bits to 1. The, once the enable bit is set, data transmission can occur. Optionally, the SPI interrupt can be enabled. The SPI interrupt can be configured using the int control register. Similar to other peripherals, the int level bit field enables and sets the priority level of the interrupt. An example of SPI interrupt vector is shown on the left. Notice how there is only one per port. The SPI interrupt flag is set when a serial transfer is complete. And yes, there's in fact only one interrupt flag for each SPI module. Because data is transmitted and received simultaneously, if the interrupt flag is set, then a full byte of data has been both transmitted and received. Next, we'll discuss how data is actually handled using the SPI system. In other words, how an SPI transfer is initiated. In master mode, to initiate a data transmission, you must write data to the data register. Any data that was received after a write was completed can be read back from the same register. Because SPI is implemented using shift registers, transmission and reception are very closely related, unlike some other forms of serial communication. 
To be able to either transmit or receive data, you must start by writing to the data register. To reiterate, even if you only want to read data from a slave device, you must still start by writing to the data register. Once the data has been fully shifted in and out, the SPI interrupt flag in the status register will be set. That is all that is required if the goal is a simple transmission. If you wish to also read the data that was shifted in, it will now be available to read from the data register. Note that this procedure would cause the interrupt flag to be automatically cleared since the data register is read after the status register. Executing the SPI interrupt vector would also clear the interrupt flag. Overall, the SPI system of the XMEGA is pretty straightforward and easy to set up. But just because it's easy to configure doesn't mean nothing can go wrong. While the XMEGA's SPI modules may not take long to configure, any data sheets for the slave devices on the bus should also be studied to ensure all of the parameters are shared properly. Section 22 of the XMEGA AU manual has more information on the SPI system, and there are plenty of details that were omitted from this video, so as always, make sure you still read through the relevant sections of the manual.